So we will begin with prayer. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you one more time that we can come to you and, and that we can ask you to give us wisdom as we look at your word. Lord, we pray that you'll help us to find the right balance um, in the things that we do that seem to be ritual, and yet they are things that you've told us to do, and there's a purpose for them. We pray that you'll just help us to understand that better tonight. In your name we pray, amen. All right, let's read Mark 1, 1 through 11. Um, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John did baptize in the wilderness, and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of, a, of skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. And, he, and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So, we're talking about baptism tonight. And I hope that, and maybe I'll do this as just, because we, we are going to try to arrange for a baptismal service uh, sometime in January, hopefully. And, and so I kind of, hmm? in the plat, yes. It'll be a little bit cold. <laughs> oh, my. Um, no, we'll do that inside. <laughs> we don't want to have any cardiac arrest. Wow. So as we talk about baptism, oh, and, and I, start, I said that, so hopefully if there are other people I know that have expressed interest in being baptized, full disclosure, okay? I was going to talk about this this morning, but I left my notes at home. I grabbed the wrong notebooks. <laughs> so here we are this evening, and we're just going to go with it being providential. Um, so we, we kind of have a we have a different format tonight, somewhat. Although it does feel like I wind up just preaching at y'all, just sitting down to do it. Uh, so. Question, have you ever just, if, if, are you like me, ever wondered what, what's the purpose of it? Why do we dunk people in water? What good does it do? And, and have you ever wondered that? Yeah, I'm the only weird one here. Here's, here's my problem probably is that uh, I'm, I'm probably not super emotional and I like things just to line up real nice and make a whole lot of sense. And, and so I can have a whole system of theology that makes really good sense to me, and I have a hard time plugging in something like this that is symbolic. Why, why are we so hung up on something that's symbolic? Well, we're going to try to talk, to, try, talk about it tonight. Um, to me, you know, I, I've looked at it like it's just, being dunked in water, and yet um, it's something that Scripture seems to tell us that we should do. And so, we're going to talk about it. Now, this, this was a thought that crossed, once again, my strange mind. So, where we find here, Mark chapter 1, we come across John out in the wilderness baptizing people. Where did it come from? Did he just decide to start dunking people in the Jordan? And, and what it tells us is that he's baptizing them after the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So, 
And, and you and I both know that people could go way off on a tangent there and come up with some false doctrine, because they have. We're going to get to that, though. I, I don't think I should jump ahead too much. Uh, but where did baptism come from? We find him there. Where did it, do you, John probably didn't just make this up out of the blue one day, right? Okay, so anybody know where it came from? So maybe some saw that as a precursor when, when Elijah had name and dip in the Jordan seven times. Yeah. Well, I, that's kind of, I'm, yeah, I'm trying. Kind of, not word for word. Um, he had, so, yeah, Elijah had, and probably that's the first time when Elijah had name and dip in the Jordan seven times. And he was, he was cleansed of his leprosy, which we understand to be, a lot of times that's used as a type of sinfulness, right? John came in the spirit of Elijah, that's right, that's good. Um, how many years do you suppose it was between Elijah and John? Yeah, it's probably more like 800-ish, I think. Um, that's just off the top of my head, but I think that's pretty close. So, um, it might have been six, seven, anyhow. Even then, we don't find any real record of that happening in the Old Testament. I did do some reading, okay, and, and according to, I'm, I'm quoting from Wikipedia, forgive me, okay, <laughs> the practice of baptism emerged from Jewish ritualistic practices during the second temple period, okay, out of which figures such as John the Baptist emerged. Now that would have been uh, five or six hundred years, five hundred or so. For example, various texts in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Corpus at Qumran, describe ritual practices involving washing, bathing, and sprinkling and immersing. <clears throat> so, there, there's a clue, right? And I'm going to get back to that in a minute, but I want to talk about baptism, why, why we do it. Baptism is considered to be a part of the means of grace. We've talked about means of grace, but let's talk about what it means, um, what we mean by that. So, I, I found on the website of a Lutheran church, it says this, the means of grace have, um, sorry, the means of grace have an offering or conferring power by which God offers to all men forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. And I'm going to come back and talk about this when I finish it, okay? And an operative or effective power by which the Holy Spirit works, strengthens, and preserves saving faith. So, do we believe that we get baptized and pop up and we're saved? No, that's the, that's the short answer. We don't believe that salvation comes by the water or the ritual, but that it is a visual reminder that salvation is offered to all. Okay, so that's, that's the first part of that uh, statement that I just read from the Lutheran Church, that, that it's an, it shows the offering or the conferring power by which God offers to all men forgiveness of sins. Um, not through baptism, but baptism is a symbol of that. It's a reminder that God offers to everybody the privilege of being forgiven of their sins. So, it's a visual reminder that salvation is offered to all, and it's a visual encouragement to continue in walking with God. And, and I kind of see that like this, that 
when we are baptized it, in that testimonial, it doesn't always work this way, but it's an encouragement at least that when we're baptized, we're saying something before people by what we're doing. And so when we go down the road and Satan comes and tempts us and says, well, you never really were saved. You never really surrendered to God. You never really meant it. There's a reminder. Wait a minute. Remember, I was dipped under the water in baptism by the preacher in front of all these people. And that marks a point visually for the people who saw it and and physically for the one who was dunked, saying, I made that decision and that decision was based on the fact that I was giving my life completely over to God. Now, it has to be, you have to be baptized in that spirit. <clears throat> there was a book written by a guy, and it was written in 1851, so it's, it's pretty old, by a guy named Bickersteth. And, and he says there are seven means of grace. And if you think of means of grace as the things that help us to find our way to God, this makes a lot of sense. Hearing the gospel, the study of scripture, prayer, Religious meditation and self-examination, by the way, that, that's kind of when you have when, when you have personal devotions, okay, whenever you come aside by yourself to read your Bible and to pray and talk to God, you're covering those things. You shouldn't just read Scripture, but you should study Scripture to understand what God is saying to you by it and then you pray over it, and you can carry your other things in prayer to God. And then as you pray, have you ever heard people talk about prayer and say it's two ways? It, we're, we're talking to God, but what if God wants to talk to us? That's where in the Christian life, religious meditation comes into play, and then self-examination is asking the Holy Spirit to examine your heart that you can compare your life and your heart to what Scripture says and what He has for us. And then the fifth is fellowship. Sixth is baptism. And the seventh is the Lord's Supper. All three of those things are something that's found within the church, not, not necessarily the church building or even a denomination. It's something that God meant for His church to be. Fellowship, and then within that fellowship, Baptism is a testimony before the people with whom you have fellowship and the Lord's Supper is, is honoring and remembering and commemorating what Jesus did for us together. So, we're going to examine baptism within the Scripture and we're going to begin by looking in the Old Testament and then we'll move to the Gospels and we'll talk about uh, how it looked in the New Testament church as well. But let's begin with baptism, with its roots in the Old Testament. So it, we talked about it being in the Second Temple period. Um, and, and that from that emerged John the Baptist. That's hundreds of years, okay? When, when, you, when you calculate, I mean, we know that from the time that the Old Testament, the last book that we have, in our Bible, in the Old Testament, is Malachi. From Malachi to Matthew is 400 years, approximately. Um, so, and, and, and the closing period that we find within the Old Testament is where the Jews are back in their land, and they have rebuilt the temple. And uh, that the, what we read, the tradition at least, is that it began in that period, and it went through those five or six hundred years. It grew to what John the Baptist was doing when we find him in, uh, as the forerunner of the Christ. All right. So, there's probably several things that would be the basis for dunking people in the water. Now, I, I, in this lesson, I'm not covering um, sprinkling and, and all of those things because it, it really 
isn't what we're talking about. Um, we're talking about the how baptism fits into Scripture and historically. So the basics for dunking people in the water is probably a practice that started when the Jews came back to Jerusalem after the exile. What I'm about to say to you is not something that is in Scripture, okay? You, you can do with it what you will. I'm just going to tell you some history and how baptism could fit into that. Ezra records, and, and I think we're fairly familiar with the story, <clears throat> that the basically the, the ten tribes that were called Israel, whose uh, capital city was Samaria, were gone. They were taken into the north countries, and, and they, they were just completely dispersed. But God kept a remnant, and, and he took the people of Judah. Okay, so the kingdom was divided, and, and really, Judah is a word that's representative of Judah and Benjamin, and possibly some of Manasseh. Um, they would have been in the southern part of what, what was Israel originally, and, and still would be today, around Jerusalem and, and down to the south of there. Um, those people were taken... Not, not in one whole group, to, and, and they were taken across into Babylon, uh, by, but, but they were taken in stages. So they were basically conquered people the whole time, but then there would be a king who was very, very weak. So there they are. God had told them that the, the Sabbaths, that they had not kept for the land would be kept. That was 70 years. So their, their land lay dormant and basically barren. There were very few people left. There were some, but a very few left. And then after 70 years or so, they started to come back. And that is, is the, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah tell us about that. Here's where I'm trying to go with that story. Ezra tells the story of how they, they worked and rebuilt the walls and rebuilt, they rebuilt the houses and the temple. Uh, they began to rebuild the temple. And things were going along very well. People had a fervent heart. There was work before them. They, it was God's house and it was God's city. And they found and read what the law was, so they had a rough idea at least what the law was. And then Ezra had to go back, and, and he left the country for a while. And then he came back, and he found uh, that the people who had caused them to sin in the very first place, all those hundreds of years before, had been allowed to make inroads into the people again including the people that had, um, some of the people that had made it difficult to rebuild were living back among the people, and they were in the temple. And Ezra, understandably so, was very upset. And basically they had a revival. And the, Ezra told the people, this is what got us in this place of captivity before and, and we can't violate God's law like this. We cannot do this. And the people heard him and they uh, vowed to do better and, and not to do those things anymore. And uh, they reformed. So now we go back to Leviticus and Numbers both have, uh, they have a description of how there's supposed to be a water that, that's a water of purification or a water of separation. And what happens is they find a red heifer. This is how it's supposed to work. A red heifer, and, and it's, it's supposed to be completely perfect. And they take it and uh, they, they do the sacrificial things. And, and then it's all, everything about that red heifer is supposed to be burnt. And then 
all of the ashes from the red heifer are taken and they're to be mixed with, um, well, I'm sorry, as, the, as the, this final burning of the heifer and all of its parts is taking place, they throw in, excuse me, cedar wood, which I think we understand that. They throw in hyssop, which would be kind of a, a bush. Um, maybe it would be like kind of like sage or something like that. Um, and then scarlet, which obviously scarlet is uh, going to be so- something that's symbolic once again, but it should be a cloth or something like that, and it's all thrown in there together. Okay. So then those ashes are taken very carefully, Okay, because what happens then is there's, there's an explanation that these ashes are to be sprinkled over running water. You don't just get any water. And this, there's significance in this even. You don't just get any water because you, can, you don't want brackish water. You don't want dirty water. This is a water purification. It's to be water that's running, so as in a stream. I heard somewhere, and I don't, I don't know how, this is just kind of one of those tales we told when we were kids, uh, that 35 or 55 feet of, of hard running water purifies itself. So, I, I don't know if that's true, but that's what we talked about. Um, I think that, but that's the point. Water will, running over rocks, crashing over rocks, if there are impurities, say from a dead body upstream or something like that, an animal, that sounded weird, um, it's dead upstream, at, at a certain point it actually purifies itself of those things. So, this is, this is to be naturally purified water and then the ashes are mixed with the water and you have the water of separation or the water of purification so now we have brought um, we've brought water into this so if you have if, if you're if you're going with what history tells us somewhat that this happened after this revival in Ezra, and, and they knew something of how this water was to work, then is that where they began to actually, for the purification of themselves? Now, in, in the Levitical days, they sprinkled this water. It wasn't necessary to be dunked in it. But is, that, is it for purification that they dunked people in this? Um, some of the things that talk about in, in, in let me say this so Ephesians 5:26 Paul speaking of the church he alludes to this water this water purification when he says that he that's Jesus might sanctify and cleanse it that's the church with the washing of water by the word more than once you find an allusion to this water Hebrews 10:22 let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So there is the symbolism of this water purification, purifying and cleansing our bodies. All right, so that's in the Old Testament. Leading into the New Testament, let's begin with what is... Um, called, at least in the book of Acts, John's baptism. In Acts 19.4, Paul says, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. So repentance was John's message, right? We read in Mark chapter 1, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Let's just cover repentance real quick. Repentance is saying, I have been doing it wrong God's way is right, and so I repent of having done things that way, and I agree with God that this is the way I'm going to do things, and I'm going to turn around and walk a different direction. Okay? Um, So in the New Testament, in the New Testament church, baptism was symbolic of being baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus. So, we see that symbolically in the New Testament it was addressed 
as, as the, it, it was tied to the water of separation and, ve- and a ceremonial cleansing, but it's also uh, a repent, uh, baptism is symbolic of repentance being done with the sinful life. Okay? It's also symbolic of being baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus. Colossians 2.12 Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. So baptism is symbolic of being buried with Christ and then being resurrected to new life. Not by the ritual. Once again, okay, I want to make that so abundantly clear that in when we're baptizing people, we are not saying you went down a sinner and came up a saint. All right? We don't believe that. We believe that it is symbolic. It's not by the, ri- by the ritual or by the physical elements involved, but by faith in the one who was crucified, buried, and rose from the dead. And we are identifying with him as we are symbolically <clears throat> buried in the water and come up in resurrection as Jesus did. Colossians 2.13, And you being dead in your sins, hath he quickened made alive together with him. However... Acts 11.16 says, and, and this is Peter talking, Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized you with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. So the means of grace, the baptism of repentance, is a physical precursor to the key baptism of the New Testament church, and that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3.11 quotes John the Baptist this way, He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, and with fire. So the actual baptism, and that wording is on purpose, okay, there's, there's physical baptism, but the actual baptism that's most important is, and, and it was what John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. <clears throat> so, there's the actual baptism, the spiritual baptism, is this baptism. There's the baptism of repentance. There's the baptism of complete surrender that we see symbolized or, or that the Apostle Paul said was symbolized by death and of purification with fire. So as fire burns, and as it burns its fuel, it does three things. It consumes so God the Holy Ghost wants to consume some things out of our lives. Okay? It makes energy. Listen, we understand that it's only by the power of the Holy Ghost at work within us that we are able to do anything. Without Him, we are nothing. And so, He is a form of energy. Fire makes energy. The Holy Ghost will be the all-consuming motivator in the life. And then it purifies. So, nothing destroys impurities like fire does. So we started with the question, do you ever wonder why we actually do this thing? Let's close with some questions. Why then should I be baptized? As I mentioned, it's a public testimony. It, it's, a, it's, not, it's something that everybody sees. It's something that everyone will point to. Everybody knows When you stand up front and you say, I'm going to be baptized, that you're making a testimony that I have, I'm done with the sinful life and I'm walking a different path. It's an encourager. So so that's at the point when you're past that point and you remember your own testimony, it encourages you to keep walking. It's a reminder and it's also something that is one of the means of grace that has been the means of grace within the church in all of its history. When should I be baptized? After clear repentance. In other words, it doesn't do any good to be baptized if you aren't interested really in being made right with God. So you should be baptized after clear repentance, after seeking God in prayer, and asking his will, and then after you have decided, as soon as possible. 
Then there's one last question. Who should baptize me? And that one sounds complicated, doesn't it? I'm not talking about the preacher. We should be baptized ultimately with the Holy Spirit. That's the one who, that Jesus promised. And, and John talked about the one who's coming after, baptized you with the Holy Ghost and fire. All right. Any questions? So when we talk about the age of accountability and apply that to the time that we should be baptized, as you said, you've heard as young as 10, as old as 13. I have known people who testified that they were, when, uh, and old people, who looking back, said, I was saved at the age of four or five at mom's knees or grandmother's feet, you know. Um, and, and it's not just stories that I've heard, it's, people I've known. Yes. Infant baptism is not the subject that we're going to cover tonight. Yeah, 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 I know <laughs> yeah, right. I know, I know. I, I think that covering like infant baptism, I think that we catch the spirit of that whenever we do, um, whenever we dedicate babies. But but the spirit of the baptism that we just discussed tonight requires somebody making a very cognizant decision. I and, and and that was the last question. When should I? Second to the last question. When should I be baptized? When there's definite, clear repentance, and and that's not going to happen in a baby, but could happen in a five-year-old. God knows their hearts, you know. Well, yeah. All right, anyone else? All right, any new prayer requests? must be old, Jim. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Over 30 years, all right. All right, let's pray together. Our Father, we come to you this evening, and we have so many friends of ours who have needs, and we want to bring them before you. We pray for the Opals, Lord, that you'll be close to that family in their time of loss. We pray that you'll be with you'll be with Paul and Amber tonight, and be close to them, and help Paul to Heal as quickly as he can, Lord, according to your will, is how we ask it, dear Jesus. We know that you can do things in a miraculous way. We pray that in this time you'll be close to them and work in their lives. Lord, we pray that you'll be with um, that you'll be with Jim, Jimmy. Lord, be with him, and we know that whenever we talk to him and communicate with him, we feel the stress that he's under. Lord, would you just bring a supernatural calm to his spirit and help him to lay even his very own son in, in your hands and trust you, Lord. We thank you for what we've seen in Brandon's life, and we thank you for his receptive spirit and his interest in coming to, the, to church whenever he gets out of the hospital, Lord. We pray that you'll be close to him and help him, Lord, to follow hard after you. And we pray that you'll give him healing and, and continue to work in, in the physical part of what's, what's keeping him in the hospital, Lord. And We pray that you'll help him at, at, as he does the therapy, that you'll help him to be able to do the things that he needs to do, especially in his job, and we pray for the rest of his family. Lord, we pray that you will be with 
Delbert and Donna Scott, be especially with Donna and give her a healing touch, we pray. Lord, we pray that you will be with uh, the others that have been mentioned. Lord, no doubt, we, pray, we want to pray for Shannon tonight. We pray that you'll continue to touch her. We thank you for what you've done in her life and in her, uh, in her healing, Lord. We pray that you'll continue to give her a touch and help her to be able to come back to church again. We pray that you'll be with Tony and Lachelle as they finally are able to celebrate their their uh, marriage with the trip. We pray that you'll be close to them and keep them safe and help them, Lord, to honor you in everything that they do. Lord, we pray that you'll be with Hector and the Spanish people. Lord, you know the needs that are associated with that. And you know the you know the, the things that are kind of difficult, Lord, uh, with those people not speaking our language and coming from a culture where they didn't have things, Lord, and sometimes they we don't understand why they do what they do, but Lord, help us to love them. Help them to know that we love them. And Lord, we pray that you'll just uh, smooth over the differences and uh, that, that you'll help them as they seek you to come to a place where they know you. You make the difference, Lord, and, and you can make the difference in their lives. And we pray that you'll find, they'll find you to be a special friend and help in, in this time. We pray that those who are separated from their families will be able to be reunited as soon as possible. All of the needs that are there, Lord, we pray that you'll be with them. Lord, we pray for the kids that are in children's service tonight, the kids' connection. We pray for their families. Lord, we've, we've been holding them up before you, and we continue to hold up the Roser family and the McAllisters and the Jacob and Melissa Pray that you'll be with them and, and be with Nikki and Dean. Lord, we pray that you'll be with uh, Memphis and, and Melody, Lord, that you'll be close to her, work in their lives, we pray. Lord, we, we want to just be faithful to hold up people before you and intercede for people. Lord, we pray for... Those who are traveling today, we thank you for bringing Jim and Val back safely, and we pray that you'll continue to help them. Then, Lord, we pray for our church. We pray that you'll be with each one who comes and that people's lives will be changed. Lord, we pray for the things that are coming up. We pray that you'll be with us in our children's program, be with the women of worth. On Saturday, we pray that that will be a time that's profitable for them. We pray that you'll help us as we come close to Christmas, our candlelight service and all of those things. May they be more than just um, just something that we do, but may they be a place where people can be contacted and brought into the church and that through that their lives may be affected and they can come to know you. We pray that you'll help us as we move forward. Guide us. We need your guidance. We need your touch. Lord, we pray that you'll just be with us throughout this week, be with us as we come together again according to your plan, according to your will. It's in your name that we pray it. Amen. Thank you very much.